Okay, welcome everybody for our fourth and last module of analysis using R. It's a nice Friday afternoon. Everyone's had lunch. If you need to get up and stretch to keep yourselves awake, please do so. This afternoon, we're going to be covering basic differential expression analysis. Um, so we're going to do, you know, RNA-seq analysis. How do you, if you have two conditions, A versus B, you've measured thousands of genes using, say, RNA-seq. That's the example here. How do you ascertain which genes are statistically differentially expressed? Although this application is specifically about RNA-seq, the lessons are going to apply to any other high-throughput um, omic-style analysis, and we'll talk about that in a bit. So there are some lessons to learn even beyond just differential expression. So by the end of this lecture, you will hopefully understand the key steps in identifying differentially expressed genes. How uh, then you're going to do multiple testing. We've all heard multiple testing. You've got to correct for multiple testing. So you are going to learn how to correct for multiple testing and how to use QQ plots to tell if it looks like you've got a real signal um, or your signal is does not look any different from uh, you know, a noisy data set. Uh, then you will learn how to create a volcano plot, which is a common visualization to, to show um, you know, what is a full change of your um, gene expression in A versus B and how statistically significant is your result. It's a very common visualization. And for those of you who don't work in RNA-seq, just kind of think about what the um, what the similarities are for the other assays that you use. So if you do metabolomics, you're also going to be doing multiple testing correction, and you're also going to be visualizing the signal in a particular way. So there's some common themes here. RNA-seq data generation. Let's start in the beginning, right? Um, how do you generate RNA-seq data? So Let's focus uh, on the left-hand side here. This review article, you know, I got this from a review article that talks about three broad different techniques for generating transcriptomic data. Um, we can go with short read sequencing, which is what we're going to focus on, on today. Basically, you know, you start with a cell, you sort of get the DNA, you fragment the, the R, sorry, you get the RNA, isolate the RNA, and then you break it down because your RNA could be, you know, several kilobases if it's like unspliced. And then uh, you reverse transcribe it to cDNA. And then for sequencing, you need to ligate some adapters to it to help it amplify because the signal in the cell is really small. So now you've done PCR amplification of, um, of the uh, um, cDNA. Finally, you do some size selection and then you do sequencing. Now, why is it important to understand what the steps were in generating the data? Because when you have to process the data, you have to be aware of the, the steps that you need to do to control for all the data generation steps. For example, if you've ligated adapters to your molecules, one of the first things you're going to do when you get your raw reads, which is the output from the sequencer, is you're going to trim the adapters. You've got to trim the adapters out of the sequence, right, from the sequencing reads um, before you even tr try to align your reads to the genome. Um, if you've got PCR amplification, PCR might create duplicates, right, which is going to bias your abundance estimates. So you have to to apply a PCR deduplication step when you do the data processing. When you are learning any new omics pipeline, go look for a field standard review article, which talks about what the key steps are in the processing pipeline. For things like RNA-seq, CBW has a special course for RNA-seq data analysis. If you can find a dedicated workshop for your particular uh, workflow and you think this is gonna benefit me, I should do this, go do it that way. If that's not an option, then look for, you know, um, a kind of a how-to guide, like a protocols guide. These exist for, from time to time, somebody in the field who's like a leader in the analysis portion is going to write up a review article with nice workflow diagrams saying step one, step two, step three, do this, do this, do this. 
And then that's how you build your software analysis pipeline. But the point is, you have to be aware of what is happening to the biomolecules that you are measuring on the other end um, for in order for them to make it there. Because during processing, you have to take care of the extra stuff that you had to add on there to get the measures in the first place. So for example, um, if you are using RNA-seq data but, and you're going to align it to the genome, then you better use a genome aligner tool that is aware of the fact that you could have spliced transcripts, right? Because in a spliced RNA transcript, the introns have been removed. And then if you, you ask the computer and you say, well, where does this align to the genome? It's going to say hey, nowhere really because it's a bunch of stitched exons together. So you have to have a splice aware aligner, right? If you have DNA methylation data and you use bisulfite conversion to measure methylated versus unmethylated cytosines, you better have a methylation aware aligner. So it's not a one size fits all. Every data type is going to require different software tools because of the nature of the data. So you have to know how it was generated. Okay. So high level overview, what is, you know, how do you process RNA-seq data? Um, for next generation sequencing, you know, ChIP-seq, uh, ATAC-seq, uh, single cell genomics, DNA methylation sequence, any kind of biomolecule like DNA, RNA type readout uh, that's generated through an omic assay, you're going to go through some variation of this process. So it's good to know how this works. So the good thing is that the field has standardized data formats to represent these kinds of data. So if you go to any kind of sequencing core and you get your raw data, you are going to get back fast Q files. Okay. If you get aligned data, you are going to get back BAM files or SAM files. Okay. So these terms, like the term FASTQ here, is like a community standard file format, which is great because it means that you can take the FASTQ, it follows the rules of being a FASTQ file. You can plug it into the software tool that takes FASTQ as input. So I could have outsourced my data sequencing to some genomics core overseas, and I get my data. They give me FASTQ files, I can apply it to my pipeline. Standardization. Right, you, you actually cannot, you cannot underestimate the power of standardization because it kind of makes our workflow very streamlined. So, NGS pipeline, we sequence things. We sequence DNA. We sequence RNA. Sequencers, you know, uh, then they then they you know call the bases. They say, oh, here's a read. A read is sort of a short string of DNA RNA, and then the sequencer will read the letters. Of the uh, of the nucleotide string, and it'll put it it'll give it to you in this file called a FASTQ file. A FASTQ file is text readable. You can open it up and you can look at it. What it will give you is it'll give you for each read what is a sequence and something called base quality. This means how sure am I that this base is what I've called it? Okay, the quality score is embedded in there. So the first thing you have to do. Um, and this actually review article has not shown this step. The first thing you do with your FASTQ is you look at the quality of your FASTQ using a tool such as FASTQC, okay? So you got your RNA sequence, you got, you got your cDNA sequences, um, and now you first look at the quality of those and you trim out those adapters. Adapter trimming is a common part of the pipeline. We're not gonna go through all this. We're just gonna do the differential expression analysis, but you should know like, this, is how it's, this is how it's generated not just this black box and here's a read count, right? So you got the sequences, you trim them for adapters. Now you have a bunch of sequences. You need to find out where in the genome they came from so that you can count your abundance of your uh, RNA molecule or your chromatin accessibility or what have you. For this, you use a set of tools called sequence aligners. Sequence aligners are particular about what kind of data they take in because under the hood, they're making assumptions like I could have unspliced and spliced RNA and I need to align them differently. Splice-aware aligner, methylation-aware aligner, right? 
for RNA sequencing, top hat, star, high sat, these are different sort of um, accepted tools. There's usually a, a lot of tools. So I would suggest, you know, you find, um, you know, an authoritative review article for your data type, and you also do a little field research. Okay, the top three people or teams in my field that have published in peer reviewed journals, what are they using? That's a defensible pipeline. Everybody seems to be using STAR, you know, or whatever. So you get your reads, you align them to the genome. Now you have a bunch of coordinates for the genome, okay? Um, then you quantify the abundance. So you use a separate set of tools for this. The output of alignment can either be called a SAM file or a BAM file, depending on whether it's in text format or binary format. Often these files are quite huge, you know, gigabyte, you know, gigabytes huge. So they will compress them and convert them into a computer readable but not human readable format. Okay, so SAM and BAM, they're like the same thing, different format. So your second set of tools. So first set of tools align the reads to the genome, then quantify how many uh, transcripts you've got um, per entity. What is the entity? It is my set of genes. Where do you go get your set of genes for the human genome? If I wanted to go get a set of li list of genes for the human genome, where would I go? Does anybody know? Where in NCBI? That's a huge website. It's a huge resource. Sorry? Oh, I didn't hear you. SRA. SRA is a repository for public data sets. It's not a consensus set of genes. So. If you, hmm. yeah. Geo is also a repository of published data sets. So if you want to get a set of genes, you can go to GenCode. GenCode is a sort of a, a standard, a community standard where you can get um, the list of all the genes in the genome or the list of all transcripts in the genome, right? So you can go to the GenCode website and if I want to just figure out the coordinates of all the genes in the genome, you can just get there. They have like a basic version. Then they have one with the, I don't know, many different variants of genes and things. I usually just get the basic version. It's in a file format called GTF. Guess what? Bioconductor has a package that lets you read GTF. So you can just type Bioconductor, how to read GTF file format. So this is the thing about bioinformatics. There are a lot of different file formats, but the good news about Bioconductor is that if it's a reasonably popular format, there's a package for you to read it in. So you don't have to like write the code to parse it from scratch, okay? So when you wanna, so these tools, which count the features will tell you, give me the set of gene coordinates because these tools are general purpose. They're gonna work for C. elegans, they're gonna work for humans, they're gonna work for mouse, Drosophila, you name it, right? So you have to give it this, the, the files, the reference files for your uh, organism. If you wanna get sequence aligner, we'll ask you for the human, human genome sequence because it's gonna align it to the genome sequence, right? So UCSC is a good website to get the human genome sequence. Sequences come in FASTA file format. Like for every kind of data type, there's a format, okay? And there are readers and writer functions in Bioconductor. So if you have a hunch, I couldn't be the first person doing this. People do this all the time. See if there's a Bioconductor package for it. Okay, so we got our reads. We aligned them to the genome. We counted how many transcripts we've got, right? Um, and then we do the differential expression um, analysis, okay? This is, where we've, this is where we've gotten to now. So that's how you get to the part of differential expression analysis. Yes, yes, yes. And that's the modeling part. All of this, all of this other data processing comes before that. Some cores, when you generate data through them, they will do a little sort of preliminary analysis for you off the get-go. So if they can process the files for you and just give you get everything when 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 you have a third party that generates a data for you, RNA seq. Don't just get the transcript counts. Get the FASTQ files, get the BAM files, right? Get everything and just save it somewhere. Like, you know, 
lab server space or something, because in the future, you might add more samples and reanalyze that data. It's your asset, right? So get everything. Okay. So at the end of this processing, you are left with your table, which has samples and gene counts. Now we are back in familiar territory. Okay. So your question remains the same as it was when we started this module. Tell me, find the transcriptomic differences. What genes are differentially expressed between A and B? But you're not just doing it for one gene. You are doing it for 20,000 genes, right? But it's pretty much the same idea at its core. You are fitting 20,000 models one at a time. That's what's happening in EDGAR. It's fitting those models 20,000 times, okay? So that means you are doing 20,000 individual statistical tests and you've got 20,000 p-values, okay? So you've got something called a multiple testing burden. I think you might've heard this like, oh, I don't know, don't have enough power to detect the difference, right? And um, so multiple testing is a, is a consideration that you have to deal with when you do multiple testing of anything, transcriptomics, metabolomics, proteomics, because the end of the day, a p-value is defined as you know, what is a chance that you are going to get a difference this high by chance? That's how it's defined. What is the probability that under the null hypothesis, which means there is no disease effect, you would get a value this big just by chance? So what is the common cutoff we all like to use for p-values? Sorry, 0.05, right? So that's 5%. That means that the probability of getting a value this large by chance is 5%. That means if you didn't have any signal and you did a hundred tests on average, how often are you gonna get a value this big? Five times. So if you did a hundred tests and you did p-value of 0.05, you know, um, you're just shooting yourself in the foot because you could clearly be in that zone. So you have to do multiple testing correction. But multiple testing correction, there are, you know, there are two common ways in which we do this. The statistically speaking, you can apply what is called Bonferroni correction. Is this mic? Yes, I have to be very close. You can apply Bonferroni correction, which is your new cutoff is not 0.05. It's 0.05 divided by the number of tests you've done. Okay. And so if you've done 100 tests, your p-value is now 0.05 divided by 100, right? So that's one way of doing it. Another way is called the benjamin Hodgeberg method of false discovery rate correction. I will talk about that as we go on. Um, but there's also an incentive to not test every last gene. Do you think every last gene has a chance of being differentially expressed? between A and B. So if a gene is identical across your cases and controls, is it worth doing a statistical test on that gene? No, not even probably not. No, it's not worth it. So you are taking on multiple testing burden for things that you don't need to test. What if a gene isn't expressed anywhere in case or control? Maybe it's a liver gene and your study is in the brain, right? It's zero across the board. Why should you test it? So for that, we do some filtering and we exclude genes with low read count. You might do this in your other assays as well. If something is, you know, a zero across the board, remove it. In methylation microarrays, you get half a million measures per sample, right? If I'm going to sit and do, you know, CPG wise tests, I've done half a million statistical tests. Forget it, I'm not gonna get anything. So what you do there is you might rank all your probes based on their variance and say, I'm only gonna check the first 50%, for example, right? There are other clever techniques. Um, but anyway, the concept is you're doing multiple testing and if you can reduce that testing burden from the get-go, great. 
So it is very common in RNA-seq analysis to first exclude genes with low count. Then you have to understand how these data were generated. They were generated by sequencing the input for each sample. What if there's variation between how much one sequence happened to be sampled versus the other one happened to be sampled, right? Your statistical model is gonna pick that up. And if enough of it adds up across groups, it's gonna call that a difference, but it's not. It's because there was sampling variation between your subjects. So what you have to do is you have to do something called normalization or correction so that everybody is, you know, we, 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 we kind of scale each person's abundances based on how deeply they were sampled. So if somebody was sampled twice as much, then their abundances get scaled by half. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Now we are ready to fit our model, okay? So the way that, um, the way that uh, EDGER works, and this is a very common technique in statistics is, you compare a null model to a full model, and you see which one the data fit better. The null model is expression can just be explained by, um, you know, the intercept and batch effect, say. The full model is expression can be explained by intercept, batch effect, and disease. And then the likelihood ratio test ascertains which model your data fit better. Okay, so that's, that's what it's doing there. And what is the model it's using? It's using a version of the Poisson, it's a negative binomial model, because this is for count data, RNA-seq is count data. So if you have RNA data generated by the older microarray technology, you cannot apply EDGER to it because EDGER works for count-based data. Maybe there's a version of the flavor of the function that works, but the point is every library you use it's assuming a certain statistical distribution of the data. That is the nature of how that J data was generated. Okay. And then you run this model 20,000 times. And then finally, yes, it's a negative binomial distribution class of GLMs, it's a count data. And then finally, you get what's called a nominal p value. The nominal p value is the unadjusted, uncorrected p value. Okay, yeah, that's the term nominal p value. Then you apply multiple tests and correction to get a q value or FDR value. And then you say, you know, a thousand genes passed differential expression. How many are upregulated, downregulated? That is a topic of other courses and you know concepts. Okay. So let's look at a worked example for RNA seq. Okay. 